Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I trust everyone can hear me. Uh, if so, you can confirm that you can hear me. Yes, I can. We can hear you. Ah, uh, no, that's good then. Uh, my name is uh, Takunda Kal Kuforuno. Uh, I'm from Zimbabwe. Uh, since we're at church, I'll introduce myself in relation to church. I'm an elder at one of the churches in the Zimbabwe West Union Conference which is uh, Emmanuel SDA Church, which is in the West Zimbabwe Conference. Uh, I'm the first elder there, and I look forward to enjoying this first pass with you people. Uh, without wasting much of your time, allow me to read the text for consideration, which will be Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 36. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 36 a parable commonly known as the parable of the Good Samaritan. But for purposes of my devotion, or rather sermon, it's actually a full sermon. For purposes of my sermon, the title of our sermon this evening will be a collection of attitudes. A collection of attitudes. I will explain the relevance of that later after I've read the passage. The passage. Verse 25 says, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? <clears throat> he said unto him, What is written in the law, and how readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor is thyself. <clears throat> and he said unto him, <clears throat> Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. But the lawyer, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, Who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and hooded him, departing, leaving him half dead. And by chance they came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he genied, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell amongst the thieves? Then the last verse in the chapter then says, and he said, so to reflect not the last verse, verse 37 then says, And he said, He that showed mercy on him, then Jesus said unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Right, let us pray. Our kind, loving Father, as we start your sermon, please be with us and ensure that everything said here is a true reflection of a will amongst us. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Right, allow me to... Analyze what I just read as quickly as I can, and then you guys can enjoy the rest of your Sabbath. Right. The Bible is careful with words. The Bible says, and a certain lawyer stood up. That's a loaded statement, and allow me to unpick that statement for you. In other words, the Bible is saying, one who professed to be well-skilled in the laws of Moses and whose profession was to explain the law and was ethically bound to keep the law stood up. Right? What, what am I saying? They are saying that lawyers, by profession and by training, they are skilled in the law, which explains why they are called learned. And beyond them being learned, they have an ethical duty to keep the very law that they are experts at. So the Bible is saying a, 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 a fundi of the law stood up. Not just a fundi of the law, 
but actually a fundi in practice of the law stood up. And the Bible is saying as he stood up, his intention was to test Jesus. What, what does the Bible mean when it says his intention was to test Jesus? I'm saying his intention was to interrogate Jesus. And then by so doing, expose Jesus. Then also by so doing, show himself to be a good student of the law. And most importantly, a better keeper of the same than Jesus. But then notice this. Jesus ignores all, all this, what I love to call effrontery. He ignores this man's intention and directs the man to the very law the man claims to be an expert at. How does he handle him? He handles him by asking him a loaded question. He says to the man, how readest thou? How readest thou? Christ is appreciating that I'm talking to a, a learned man. And when speaking to a learned man, the best way of dealing with a learned man is directing the man to that which he claims to be an expert at. So how readest thou the law you, cl you claim to be an expert at? And notice this. The idea behind was not to embarrass the man really, but the idea behind was to lead the man into a realization of his inadequacies in regards to the essence of the law, that is loving God and loving others. But the lawyer immediately jumps up and says, but who is my what? Who is my, okay, he, he, he responds and, and he tells Jesus that what he read is that uh, if you want to inherit in a life, you should love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength and all your mind and your neighbor is thyself. Then Jesus says to me, yeah, you have answered right. In other words, you have read well. Now go, and do that which you have read. And allow me to make a side comment there before I move on. The church today, whether in Kenya there or here in Zimbabwe, in Africa at large or the world over, it is inundated with characters that speak a lot about God, but read very little about him. And I think it is incumbent upon us this evening to ask ourselves this question. How much of literature about God do we read? And after we have read, how much of what we have read do we understand? And after we have understood, how much of what we have understood do we practice? And this was the same question that Christ was probably posing to the lawyer. That you are learned is a common cause. That you have read is common cause. That you have understood is common cause. But most importantly, that what you have read, understood, and, 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 and learned, how much of it have you practiced? And that is the question I'm asking all of you this evening. Of the things you know about God, of the things you have understood about God, of the things that you have read about God, how many of those things do you practice? We move on. The Bible then says, as soon as Christ says to him, you are going to do that, the lawyer jumps up and says, but who is my neighbor? At a case or level, that question of who is my neighbor sounds like a stupid question. Why am I saying it's a stupid question? It's a stupid question in the sense that in this whole conversation, the concept of neighbor was introduced by the lawyer. Remember when the lawyer was answering Christ's question, his last phrase says, thou shalt love thy, thy, thy neighbor as thyself. So the natural question is, when you are saying thy neighbor is thyself, which neighbor did you mean? That's, that's the case really level. But however, as you go to a deeper level, you then notice that unbeknown to the lawyer, the lawyer actually was making social comment and revealing deep-seated, serious issues of belonging amongst the Jews. The Jews in and of themselves he interpreted the question of neighbor in a narrow way and did come up with a formula which systematically included others and similarly systematically excluded others. At the top of the pyramid of this matrix of neighborliness were obviously the so-called holy Jews, the Pharisees, the scribes of which this man was one of, the priests, 
the Sadducees, the, the, the Levites, etc. These men were at the top of the pyramid. Then just below them were the law-abiding Jews. What do I mean by law-abiding Jews? I'm seeing that I'm saying that Jews whose reputations were intact in society on account of them not having any public sin. Then at the bottom of the food chain, amongst themselves as Jews, were the Jews who had been caught in sin or who were living a publicly questionable life. Example of this would be the so-called sinners. If you read Luke chapter 15, the Bible says that Jews or the church of the law murmured when Christ received sinners. These men and women were the ones who were at the bottom of the food, food chain. Who were the sinners? Those maybe who publicly had been caught in sin. For example, those who were guilty of being drunkards. Those who were being guilty of being gluttons. Or those maybe like Mary, who had been caught in sexual indiscretion. So these men and women were at the bottom of the food chain. So the first question of neighbor was, can the priest at the top of the food chain be neighbor to the lowly Jew who has been caught in sin, whose character is questionable in public? Then beyond that, there was the anundram, so to speak, of the, of the Samaritans. How are the Samaritans a, a kanyundra? The Jews in this interpretation of neighborliness, as I have already given, automatically and systematically excluded Gentiles. Their perception of Gentiles is similar to the, to the perception that we as African have of, Africans have of dogs. We keep dogs outside as we are inside with our families. So when the Jews were calling us Gentiles or people Gentiles, their perception of them was similar to the perception that we have of dogs. That dogs ought to be outside as they are inside with God. Dogs are unclean as they are clean with God. So based on this interpretation of neighborliness, which excluded Gentiles, Samaritans posed a queer a, a, a problem in that Samaritans we have Jews and have Gentiles. So the question was, do Jews relate with Samaritans as children of a common ancestor? Or do they relate with Samaritans as children of their Gentile ancestors whom they perceive to be dogs? If you remember in John chapter 4, those who have read John chapter 4, the woman at the well who are Samaritan, when speaking to Jesus, she speaks of her ancestor, Jacob, being the one who built the well, and speaks of her ancestor, ans the, her other ancestors worshipping up a hill. So on one end, she says that I am, a, I, I, I am a descendant of Jacob. Yet when it comes to matters of worship, she is a descendant of those who worship up the mountain. So when the lawyer is saying to Jesus, who is my neighbor? Unbeknown to him, he's asking a serious question here. A question of neighborliness reading Jewish society amongst themselves in relation to the Samaritans and most important in relation to the Gentiles. So how does Jesus then address that question? The question, who is my what? Who is my neighbor? He tells the parable that I'm sure most of us know the parable of the good Samaritan, wherein a man was traveling between Jerusalem and Jericho. He fell amongst thieves. Thieves beat him up and left him to a pulp. A, a priest came that way, left him like that. A Levite came that way, left him like that. Then a Samaritan came and helped the man. Right. So now listen to the title. Remember, the title of the sermon is A Collection of Attitudes. Right. So to address the question of neighbor and its eternal consequences, Jesus shares a parable that has got four key characters plus the men. And each of them reveals certain attitudes towards the wounded man, the traveler or the wounded man that expose or affirm their understanding of neighbor. Let's list the characters here. Then I'll then show you the attitude that they had towards the, the traveling man. Number one, we have the thieves themselves. Yes, the thieves are part of the story. 
they have a certain attitude towards the traveling men. We have the priest, we have the Levite, and lastly, we have the Samaritan. So all these four show certain attitudes towards the, the traveling men or the hooded men, depending on when they meet the men. And allow me to then analyze each attitude, come up with lessons, and then conclude the sermon as quickly as I can. One, let's talk about the robbers or the thieves. What kind of attitude did they have towards the 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 traveling man? Right. The way the word that we use is a very big English word, but don't worry, I will explain it shortly. They had what I love to call a rapacious attitude towards the hundred men. A rapacious attitude towards the hundred men. That's a big English word. The word rapacious is a big English word that describes the, the, the savage behavior of wolves, hyenas, jackals, dogs, etc. All those, all those dog-like animals, the behavior that they exhibit. And how we talk about hyenas so you can understand what I mean by rapacious. Other animals, like lions, for example, before they eat an animal, the first thing that lions will do is kill an animal first and eat it. But the hyenas are so rapid, are so rapacious, are so savage, that hyenas can kill an, can eat an animal on the go. As the animal is running away, all the hyena needs to do is to take a bite. It can kill an animal as the animal is running away, can eat it as it's running away. It's a savage and cruel way of killing an animal. If you took food and you threw it amongst hungry dogs, the hungry dogs will tear each other and even the food without any concern for anyone or anything. All they care about is the food. In fact, in some cases, dogs can even bite you who's trying to feed it, feed, feed them in their bid to what to eat. And I am saying that was the behavior of the thieves. How? Them, the traveler, was someone to use and exploit for their own ends. They saw something in him or something he had, took it away with little to no regard for his life. Notice something too. Notice how the story is deliberately set by Jesus between Jerusalem and Jericho, which deductively is Jewish territory, which is dominated by racists. Yeah, this whole thing of calling other people Gentiles is racism. Those were racists, which then raises the possibility that the robbers themselves were Jewish and probably the traveler himself was Jewish, which then shows you something, that those who embrace hate are at the risk of becoming hateful. And hate therefore breeds more hate and is a master that perpetually seeks an outlet. Jews, by being racist, had embraced hate and had left them as a hateful people. And in the story, we meet them hating their own kids and kids. And this here is the point that Christ was making. If ethnicity or culture is the basis of neighborliness, how come in this story, countrymen are hating their own kids and kids? If being chosen, is the basis of neighborliness. How come a chosen man is wounded to the point of near death at the hands of fellow chosen men? Let me give you contemporary examples. Racism, tribalism, etc. is rife and real amongst us who claim to be a people who are waiting for the soon coming of Jesus. Christ. Those of you, you will hear a story of how Jews killed their, uh, not just Jews, sorry, how Tutsi, how, how Hutus killed their own fellow Tutsi, Tutsi, Tutsi Adventist church members, merely on account of the fact that the Jew, that the Tutsi, sorry, is a different tribe from the Hutus who were there in Rwanda. Here in Zimbabwe, if you read the Zimbabwe law reports, you will find in the case 
Sako Ali written is Zambezi Conference of the SDHH versus the SDA Association of the Southern Africa, uh, Division of Southern Africa in year 2000, volume one of the law reports, page 179. You'll find a serious high court case there wherein colored church members try to break off the church and the basis of their breakaway was the fact that they could not countenance, no contemplate, no accept being led by black people in an independent Zimbabwe. And the point I'm simply driving home here is the fact that racism, tribalism, and all these funny isms are real amongst us as people. And the question that Christ is saying, if you are a racist, if you are a tribalist, how is eternal life a possibility for you? You have a rapacious attitude. And this evening, Jesus has a problem with that. Second point is the issue then, what then happens afterwards? Jesus then says, a certain priest came that way. And he saw the wounded man and passed by on the other side. He saw the wounded man and passed by on the other side. What kind of uh, attitude is this? What kind of attitude is this? Right. This is called indifference. To the wounded man, to the priest, sorry, the wounded man was a problem to be ignored. To the wounded man, the, to the priest, sorry, the wounded man was a problem to be ignored. The priest saw a problem and simply did not care. His attitude is at variance with his duty as a priest. As a priest, his duty was to be of service to the weak. And most importantly, his duty was to represent God amongst weaklings. But when he sees this wounded man, he simply does not care. Notice this. Indifference, in my opinion, is convenient as one gets to mind their own business. And notice this, indifference elicits no response. What do I mean? No good can come out of doing nothing. In fact, by doing nothing, by being indifferent, the priest was taking the side of the robbers. If it was the robbers' intention to beat this man to a pulp and let him die a slow, painful death, by doing nothing about the man's situation, the priest was ensuring or aiding and abetting the actions of the aggressor. He was ensuring that the robber's plan was, 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 was going to be successful. Notice what I'm, the point I'm driving home here. The point I'm driving home is this. Indifference to suffering is cruelty veiled in political correctness, pretending there is no problem. Let's 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 discuss contemporary examples or real real examples. Apply them in our in our Christian lives. Allow me to say this. I'm saying this with great respect. Non-responsiveness to issues of social justice is an institutional problem, birthed, in my opinion, in 20, on 22 October 1844. Church Heritage says on 18 October 1844. Uh, some of our pioneers sold everything that they had before that date and were all ready to go to heaven on that particular day. And allow me to say, thank God Jesus didn't come that day. Because he did come that day, in my opinion, the bulk of the guys in that room were not going anyway. Why am I saying that? Slavery in America was at its peak. Yet none of those people huddled up in that room ready to go to heaven ever spoke out against it. And that day I say, I am sure some of them, some of the property that they sold to whomever ready to go to heaven may have included some black folk in there. This, I am sure, has happened in Kenya, but I'll speak about what I have seen with my own two eyes here in Zimbabwe. In 2005, the, the, the government of Zimbabwe went on some program called Murambatsuna. Murambatsuna was a program in Zimbabwe in the government was destroying people's homes. And their argument was that some settlements were illegally built. So they were correcting that 
of course, there were political undertones behind it. Apparently, the opposition it gained so much support in urban areas, and as a way of dispersing people back to the rural areas, they destroyed people's homes. So when they went on this particular program, thousands, if not millions, of people suddenly found themselves homeless those two weeks of the program. And I recall seeing this with my own two eyes. The other churches where I used to stay, Catholic Church, Methodist Church, Salvation Army, ETC, all opened up their doors to allow the homeless a place to sleep. But the only church that remained with its doors closed was a church whose members believe that Jesus is coming very soon. Our church. And I can even assure you right now in Kenya when whatever was going on, I am sure some youth ran away into churches and I can bet my last dollar from as far as I am where I am right now. I am sure our church's doors remained closed when the youth were crying out for a place of refuge. What is, the, what is the point I'm making here? The point that Christ was making when, when highlighting the prison difference. And the point I am making is I am highlighting the difference of the church to people suffering is this. If ordination, if the correct doctrine is the, the basis of belonging, how come we have a priest in the church so unresponsive to real life problems? Funny question I would ask, particularly here in Africa. Africa, would the priest have ignored had the wounded man been a son of an important man? You come up with your own question. Notice this. The collateral effect of indifference is generations of wounded, spiritually abused sojourners, many of whom continue to bear the emotional scars caused not just by Satan, but caused by our own church. Allow me to quote Desmond Tutu. He says, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. If an elephant has its foot on the tail of a mouse and you choose to be neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. Those with ears have had. Allow me to then quickly go to the Levite. What kind of attitude did the Levite show? Notice this. The Bible says, the priest saw the Levite when he got to the place he looked. There is a difference between looking and seeing. Seeing is involuntary. As long as your eyes work, you will see. But looking is cognitive. It's deliberate. As in, it is sight backed up by cognition. It is sight backed up by, by investigation. It's investigation. It's investigative by nature. So the Bible says when the Levite go to the place where the man was, the, the, the Levite is a good deacon to do. So the man looked at the man, investigated what could have caused the man's situation. But the Bible simply says that after doing all that, he still did nothing. What kind of attitude is that? It's called apathy. The Levite was apathetic to the man's situation. Why was he apathetic? His apathy was precipitated by a desire to protect himself from whatsoever was the cause of the man's situation. In his reading, he probably is saying to himself, if I touch this guy or help this guy, whoever did this to this guy will do the same to me. Secondly, second reason for his apathy is that he wanted to maintain his ceremonial purity in, at all costs. What, 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 what do I mean? The Mishnah, which was the Jewish law of the time, stated that no man could touch a corpse and serve in the temple. In fact, anyone who touched the corpse for health reasons was ceremonially unclean for the day. So the man, the, the Levite, is looking at the selfish side of the law where he say, okay, if I touch this guy, because the Bible is saying, remember, this guy was half dead. So, which means from one perspective, this guy looked dead. So if I touch this guy, if he be dead, I will not be able to save in the temple. But here is the funny thing. The very law he was using to justify his apathy also encumbered him with truth because the very same Mishnah stated that no corpse 
was to remain unattended anywhere in Israel. So if the wounded man was dead and indeed, indeed he was a corpse, he as a Levite and he as a Jewish citizen first, in relation to bearing it with a closed city and mourning it with whomever was a closed city. But however, he chose the side of the law that protected his selfish interests and ignored the part of the law that encumbered him with duty. In other words, I am saying selfish bigotry, narrow-mindedness took precedence over service. How does this play out? How does this apathy play out in our lives? How many times in the church and beyond have men made rules and policies taken over, taken precedence over service? I'm not saying the policies are wrong, but I'm simply saying if policies then begin to impeach the work, why then have them? Second point. Behaviorism and legalism is a toxic cocktail we save each other weekly, leaving us very unresponsive to real life issues amongst us. Every week we tell each other how to dress to church. Every week we tell each other that painting nails is wrong. Every week we tell each other that this is wrong, this is right, etc. And then after telling each other that this is wrong and this is right, we then forget to respond to people's real life issues. And the question I want to ask is, how many times have people's real life issues in church been reduced to discussion points and never action points? How many times as church members have we seen problems, gossiped about them, and still did nothing about the problems? How many even right now amongst us as a youth right now listening to me speaking right now are known to be in relationships with people's husbands and yet we discuss you and yet no one has ever confronted you about your adult. And I'm simply saying such lack of action is easy to justify but is never right. Why? Because as we are busy justifying our lack of action the wounded man is dying. Conclusion. Conclusion. The Samaritan. The Samaritan. The Samaritan, in my view, on arrival, he simply saw a human being worthy of love, care, and service. He took no regard for cultural or racial prejudices. He had no regard for the possibility of role reversal. He put his personal security at risk. He made a personal sacrifice. He incurred time and financial expenses in the name of service. It was enough for him that a human being was in need. He acted. So therefore, what Christ was saying here is neighbor is not a product of church membership. Neighbor has no reference to tribe. Neighbor has no reference to race. Neighbor has no reference to class distinction. We are merely neighbors by virtue of being people made by God. And the point that Christ is actually making there is that goodness is not a function of ethnicity. Goodness is a function of choice. You can be good. I can be good as long as we choose to be. Then back to the lawyer. He then says to the lawyer, who do you think was neighbor to the guy who was wounded? The neighbor was so set in his racism, so set in his bigotry, that he could not be heard saying the Samaritan. He simply answered and said, yeah, the one who did good to him. Christ ignores that and says to the man, go and do likewise. In other words, he's saying to the man, Go and make a realization that I am well read, yes, yet without understanding. With regards to the essence of the law, I'm well read, yes, but the essence of the law is loving God and loving others. You on your own as a lawyer, you desperately need a savior. What am I saying? Loving others is easy to preach about, but loving others is difficult to do, particularly the cantankerous 
particularly the hateful. Some guy broke your heart and I'm saying, love you. Difficult to love someone like that. Someone impregnated your sister, denied paternity. Difficult to love someone like that. So Christ is saying, go and make a realization that in relation to loving the unlovable, you are inadequate. You cannot do it on your, on your own. You need a savior to help you to that. Not only am I a teacher, but I'm your savior, capacitating you to do that which you of yourself based on your own prejudices are unable to do. So what is Christ saying? He's actually leading the guy to first John 4 verse 7, at least to you and I today, which says, dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been fathered by God and knows God. I like the line that says, everyone who loves has been what? Fathered by God. The point is to love others, you need to be born again. Some of us who are listening to me today need to be born again. Because our indifference, our apathy, our rapaciousness cannot go away in and of itself unless we are born again. I conclude this sermon with a, with a certain quotation. I read this from Martin Luther King. He says, we are called to play the good Samaritan on life's roadside. But one day, we must come to see that the whole road to Jericho must be transformed so that men and women will not be constantly beaten and robbed. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that a system that produces beggars needs to be repaid. We are called to be the good Samaritan, but after we lift so many people out of the ditch, you start to ask, maybe, just maybe, the whole road to Jericho needs to be repaved. God bless you. Thank you. Amen and amen.